Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming and watching the show, Dig In with Kelly. Um, but before we get started, we actually have some breaking news uh, this morning. Telemundo, uh, owned by NBC, is blocking our broadcast of the Pope. Um, they are saying that they own the audio. They are disputing it on YouTube. Um, so we would like to ask you, our audience, and anyone who watches this later, to get on Twitter, hit up Telemundo, let them know we want to broadcast um, this is on C-SPAN. We pay for that with our tax dollars. You can't stop us from sharing this with the world. Um, the Pope's message needs to go out. So get on Twitter, uh, hashtag free the Pope. We need his message to be heard around the world. We cannot be stopped by the corporate media. So please uh, get that message out there, hashtag free the Pope. We're going to drop the Twitter uh, handles for Telemundo and possibly NBC as well um, into our chat. So uh, whenever you guys can, tweet that out. Tweet it out every hour until we get our video back on the air. So I uh, just wanted to get that out there before we get started today. So uh, really excited about our guest today, Mr. John Perkins, author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman, is here with us today. Um, say hi to everyone, John, <laughs> if you don't hi, mind. Kelly. Hi, everybody. It's great to be with you. Really, really looking forward to talking to you today. Um, so before we do that, though, I just wanted to take a moment to talk to you guys about what the military-industrial complex is um, and also just what this show is meant to be. Um, Dig In is an idea that I had to help people educate themselves, but also help people take action. Um, as someone who's never participated, never voted, never um, played a, a crucial or any sort of part really in our political process, um, I thought it would be important to take people on my journey of discovery because I, I don't know that much about anything really. <laughs> um, I'm learning as I go. I'm, I'm discovering things as I go and what I'd like to do is talk with the people who were there, the people who know things. And our guest, Mr. John Perkins, um, has traveled the world and been a part of the machine that has systematically attacked poor countries and underdeveloped countries. And he's now become a whistleblower and, and come forward, well, back in 2004 when he published his book. So the military-industrial complex is, is a huge topic. We're only really going to touch on a very small part of it, which is the, the foundation or, or the environment that needs to exist in order for the military-industrial complex to thrive. And, and that environment is born of economic sabotage. It's born of political sabotage. It's born of manipulation. And that, and that kind of sets the stage for... Uh, the military-industrial complex to to come in and destroy a country. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Um, the military-industrial complex was something that President Eisenhower uh, saw happening after the world went through four devastating wars. And we were kind of forced to create this uh, war machine. We were forced to mass-produce weaponry. We were forced to kind of create this economy around war. Um, and it scared him. And so I want to watch, uh, I want all of us to watch this speech that President Eisenhower gave as he was leaving office in the early 60s um, and, and just take a look at that. So if you want to air that speech for us, John, that'd be great. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow Americans. We now stand ten years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence 
economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. So that speech, um, it, it brings to mind two very key and critical ingredients that create an, an environment for the military-industrial complex to thrive. And, and the first one, um, in that last statement that he made, um, only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty can prosper together. Um, that hits on an issue that affects me personally. It, it's, it's the apathetic nature of our country right now. Um, it's the fact that people aren't participating in, in the voting process, but more than that, they're not participating in the education and awareness. Um, and, and part of that is because our, our corporate media doesn't allow for these kinds of discussions to happen. Um, and part of that is because we just haven't gone out there and dug in. Um, so I went out and um, I've got some data that I pulled from a great website called infoplease.com and they use information from the Federal Election Commission. And I just want to show, uh, if I can, this graph of what voter participation looks like uh, since the 1960s, if you want to throw that up for me. Um, this shows, it, you'll see the, the top spikes are presidential years, and then the low spikes on the chart are the midterm elections. Um, and as you can see in the 1960s, when Eisenhower gave this speech, what's happened to our voter participation, but most notably what's happened to our voter participation in the midterm years, and that's what's kind of horrifying, is, is yeah, we're interested in who's running for president. You see that big spike in 2008, even though it's lower than it ever has been, um, it's it's still at least something, but when we're looking at the people who are uh, setting our budgets, who are setting our national priorities, who are um, controlling our laws, controlling our narrative, you really see that we're not even participating in electing them, and, and that's one of the big things that Eisenhower warned against, and I don't know if I can just I want to get Nissa's opinion on this as far as the rest of the world and, and what the rest of the world does with their elections, um, just if you don't mind. Uh, to kind of hear how they participate and and what they do. Well, voter participation uh, presupposes uh, information and the trust that your decision actually matters. And there are several people who are slowly coming to the conclusion that their vote just might not matter as much as we were led to believe. So it's a bit, I think, in, for example, in Denmark, we have a voter participation of over 85%, but at the same time, we have a growing distrust in the political establishment. So while those things seem mutually exclusive, if you look at our last election, you will see that our biggest party and fastest growing party in Danish history uh, got a well, was almost halved in uh, political power and size in one election cycle. It's almost unheard of. 
but if you have a two-party system or you have a system in which the game is rigged somehow against the voters' interest, against uh, where money dominates, then you lose hope. You lose, you lose the interest. And I sincerely believe that the only reason people have been interested in the presidential election is because it's like participating in in choosing the next rock star. It's like participating in some sort of pseudo soap opera and I don't think yeah, it's because okay. people actually believe that okay we're gonna elect this one man and then this one man is gonna turn everything around. Right. Yeah, and, and that's that's a huge problem. I know that that was my personal problem with with participating in voting. I've never voted. I am 32 years old. I've never voted. And I was ashamed to say that, but as I've come to realize, if we don't all say something, then, you know, what what's the point of it all? Um, so thank you. Thank you for that, that insight. And 85% and voter participation would be incredible to see from this country, and I hope that this election will We'll bring that about. Um, so, so participation is, is that first ingredient. It's that first step. That second ingredient, um, that that piece that will allow the military-industrial complex to thrive, is economic sabotage. And, and our guest, former economic hitman, uh, Mr. John Perkins, he he participated in the efforts of the NSA to enslave nations to debt and, and create an economy in which a war can thrive. And it's been really uh, difficult for people to follow this thread and to, and to see how this has happened throughout history. Um, so before we get to Mr. Perkins, I would like to just kind of show a video about um, the history of the CIA and NSA and U.S. interventions around the world, um, just to give folks who maybe don't have an idea of how this is all connected um, a visual way to grasp how the U.S. has influenced the world, um, and and what we've done to to create this environment. So you can uh, cue that, that up whenever. I'm sorry. No, ready for that. It's really old footage, guys. Yep. We're running it right now. Here we go. Here we go. Yep. Google Drive cut out on it, Kelly. We'll have to pick it up in the middle.
thanks for everyone for sitting through that with me. Um, it's hard to watch. And, you know, even years after all of these atrocities took place, uh, when our guest John Perkins released his book in 2004, he received backlash from the NSA, from the CIA, dozens of articles writing him off. Um, one of the articles I read in the Washington Post was kind of funny to me. Uh, they said, this man is a frothing conspiracy theorist, a vainglorious peddler of nonsense. Um, and I, I, I thought it was hilarious. Um, but then WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden <laughs> came out and we found out that economic sabotage is real. Um, we're doing it to our closest allies, France and Germany. And so please welcome uh, Mr. John Perkins author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman and Hoodwinked, and Economic Hitman reveals why the global economy imploded and how to fix it. Thank you so much for joining us, John. My pleasure, Kelly. It's great to be with you. So, uh, so for those who don't know you as well as I try to, um, can you tell us a little bit about what an economic hitman is and how you became one? I, yes, I'd be happy to. Before I do, I just want to mention that that film kind of ended at the beginning. Um, my book was published in 2004. I have a new one coming out February 2016 that talks about what's happened since. And it's actually gotten much worse. You know, we just overthrew the, the CIA overthrew the president of, of Honduras in, uh, uh, in 2009. Uh, we tried to overthrow Chavez of Venezuela and, and uh, the Korea of Ecuador. So this has continued and it's come home to the United States to roost and we can talk a lot more about that later. I just wanted to point out that that film is very powerful and yet in a way it stops at the beginning of the worst that's happened since since those times. Anyway. Oh and I, I definitely do. I do want to dig into that and, and so I, I have tons of questions about the future, about Syria and, and all of that and so yeah I, I definitely can't wait um, but yeah, please continue. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So you know, we economic hitmen. I think it's fair to say created the world's first truly global empire, and it's not really an American empire. It's really a corporate empire. Eisenhower talked about the military-industrial complex. It's really become a military-industrial government Wall Street uh, corporate empire. It's a corporate empire, and the U.S. government, um, the military, the Pentagon, the CIA, NSA, all the so-called intelligence agencies support it, but it's really a corporate empire. And the way this was created was m people like me, and my actual job was to identify countries with resources our corporations want, like oil, and then arrange huge loans to that country from the World Bank and its sister organizations. And yet the money wouldn't actually go to the country. Instead, it would go to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country, uh, power plants, uh, airports, highways, things that would benefit a few wealthy families in addition to our corporations, which were the main beneficiaries. Wealthy f the families that own the industries, the commercial centers that use the electricity, the highways, the ports. But the majority of the people wouldn't benefit at all. Most of them couldn't afford electricity, don't have cars to drive on the highways, can't get jobs in industrial parks because they don't hire many people. And yet, because uh, the country was trying to pay off the interest on these loans, it was taking money out of education, health care, and other services for the majority of the people. So they were really suffering. And in the end, the country can't pay off its debt. And that's part, we know that. That's part of the plan. That's the strategy. And so at that point, we go back and we say, hey, since you can't pay your debts, sell your oil or whatever the resource is real cheap to our corporations without any environmental restrictions or social regulations, or privatize uh, your power plants, your, your water and sewage systems, your schools, your, your prisons, everything. Privatize your public sector uh, businesses and sell them to our corporations. Allow us to build a military base on your soil. And in that way, we've really created this empire, a corporate-controlled empire. In the few cases where we fail, and I talk about how I failed with the democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, who also wasn't shown in that film, nor was Omar Torrijos of Panama, where I also failed. Uh, both of these men uh, had a lot of integrity. And they refused to burden their countries with this debt. They refused to pay this game, and as a result, they were both assassinated by the CIA. Uh, both of them in 1981. These are clients of mine. And in the few cases 
so these so so when the economic hitmen fail, what we call the jackals go in, and they're hired by the CIA. They either assassinate presidents or overthrow them or the governments. And in the few cases where they fail, like with Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi and Libya, then the, <clears throat> the military goes in. But I have to say that recently, it's been a decision to send the military in anyway. Because it, it, during the second Bush administration, it was very strongly recognized that the military, the wars or threats of wars, and sending the military in was really good for some of the big businesses that are part of that military industrial complex of what I call today the corporatocracy that Eisenhower warned us about. So, so what do you think caused that transition from you know, kind of doing, I, I want to say, the soft touch, the, the economic sabotage. You go in there and you kind of say, oh, well, we can make things better for you. All of your people will have infrastructure. They'll have electricity. They'll have all the, those things that they need. How did that transition happen from, from that, that methodology to what we're doing now where we're just, let's bomb them, let's get in there, let's, you know, do that? Well, I think it was, it was a lot of pressure put on both the Bush administrations, but particularly the second one. Uh, that that the war in Vietnam had been a tremendous boom to huge businesses in the United States. And I don't just mean the businesses that make the war material, the, the missiles and the tanks and the armaments and the guns. It's also the banks that, that support those, the insurance companies, the food companies, the Coca-Cola companies, the ones that supply uh, food and services to, to, to the armies. And so it was, it was recognized that, that even though you and I and the rest of the world may think we lost in Vietnam, the corporatocracy won in Vietnam and put tremendous pressure on going back into war, or at least even just the threat of war. The threat of war with Iran has been big business. It's brought in a lot of money for business. Uh, there's, a, there's a marvelous film called South of the Border uh, made by Oliver Stone where he interviews a number of leaders of Latin American states. and. He, in, in an interview with President Kirchner of Argentina, uh, he tells Kirchner, he says, if you want to increase your um, military, uh, excuse me, if you want to increase your, your economy, go to war. That's what we do in the United States. Uh, Kirchner is quoted in this film as, as quoting Bush as saying that. The film doesn't actually show Bush saying it. It shows Kirchner telling Oliver Stone that that's what Bush told him. If you want to increase your economy, <laughs> Go to war. That's what we do in the United States. My gosh, so that that's a huge statement, um, and to hear that it could have come from a president of this country is is a little startling. Um, mm. What? So I guess I would say what this this step from from economic sabotage to now basically just full scale military takeover. Um, <laughs> do you do you see any particular corporations as being responsible, or is it like a the all of them, all of them playing a part? You know, is it is it a few industries? Is it much bigger than that? What's your perspective? You know, I, I think a couple of things we need to recognize here, Kelly, and that is that um, corporations are neither evil nor good. They're not good or bad. They're just groups of people, but they're driven by goals. And their top people, some of them may be evil, some of them may be sociopaths, but I know a lot of corporate executives who, who are decent people. Uh, but when I went to business school in the late 60s, I was taught that a, that a good CEO makes a decent rate of return for his investors. But beyond that, he, is a, he, you know, he, he won't lay anybody off until he takes a cut and pay himself. He's good to his employees. He's good to his customers. He's good to communities. He pays taxes. <laughs> Imagine that. They don't do that anymore. Uh, right. But beyond that, also donates money to school systems and recreation halls. He's a good citizen. That's what we were taught back in the late 60s. That all changed in the 70s when Milton Friedman of the Chicago School of Economics won the Nobel Prize in Economics. Basically by stating, uh, to, to really simplify, he said, the only responsibility of business is to maximize profits, regardless of the social and environmental cost. That changed everything. And it's driven our system ever since. Uh, our presidents have bought into it, and including the, both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, all over the world, leaders have bought into it. Corporations have bought into it. And it, it basically gives license to, to corporate CEOs to do whatever they think they need to do to maximize profits, including essentially buying politicians. Uh, so 
So everything changed at that time. Um, suddenly, this became the only goal, and it's created an insane global economy. We have to recognize that what we have today is a massive global failure. And one sign, there's many signs, but one sign is that less than 5% of us live in the United States, and we consume almost 30% of the world's resources, while half the world is hungry, starving, or on the verge of starvation. That's not a model. China can't repeat that with close to 20% of the world's population. Russia, India, Brazil, they can't repeat that. Um, they're trying, but they can't. The numbers don't add up. So we have to recognize we've created a failure, something I call a death economy based on warfare and ravaging the earth, tearing up the earth for the benefit of a very few people. And so we need to understand that that, that has to change. Uh, and along with that, you have to change the goal of businesses so to, to help business people understand that the goal is not to maximize profits. It's to serve a public interest. Yes, make a decent, a decent rate of return for your investors, but serve the public, serve the earth, serve, you know, this fragile spaceship that we're all living on. It's, yes, it's headed for absolutely. disaster if we don't do something fast. Absolutely. So with that in mind, I mean, you know, I, I, I completely agree. We, we've kind of taken a step away from what makes us human, um, and, and that's each other. And so I, I, how, do we, how do we make that transition from where we are now and this, this mentality that we have um, back to what's real and, and back to what will make us, you know, united again? How do you think we can do that? Well, well, Kelly, I think we, we really have to recognize the responsibility that each of us has. So earlier, there was a discussion about participation in voting. And that is so small. Uh, no matter how much we participate, we saw that spike in 2008. But what happened after that? Nobody paid any attention. So Obama's elected, and nobody puts real deep pressure on him to make changes. We also need to recognize that our leaders are extremely vulnerable. If, if whoever we elect as president, very, very vulnerable. You know, um, Eisenhower, I think we have to ask ourselves, why did Eisenhower wait till, till his final speech in the White House to denounce the military industrial complex and then he never said anything more about it afterwards? Why? Because he'd been the, the number one military boss in the, in the world you know, during World War II. He was in charge of the Allied forces. He knew the dangers. He had one shot. His final speech, he exposed the system. He didn't dare do it earlier while he could have done something as president because he knew he wouldn't get away with it. After that, Kennedy became president, and he tried to do something about it, and he was assassinated. And so it was his brother, Robert, who tried to do something about it, and Martin Luther King, Jr., and ever since then, every president basically has towed the line. I think we need to recognize, too, that it no longer takes a bullet to assassinate a president. Clinton was taken down by a sex scandal. I mean, he, that was a political assassination. He, he was impeached. And his political career was ruined. He's out there making speeches and making a lot of money these days, but he has no power politically anymore. Any president today, Obama, the day he walks into the Oval Office, if not sooner, is told, by God, you know, you can do a few things, you can make a few decisions, but if you go against this system in a big way, you're going to be taken down. And, you know, everybody's got skeletons in their closet, and let's assume that there's someone squeaky clean out there. Let's assume Bernie Sanders has no skeletons in his closet. The FBI can create them. <laughs> you know, with, with the, yeah. the way they can manipulate the Internet and social media and drones and, 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 and telephone conversations, they can create a scandal. It'll, it'll ruin a person. So we have to know that our yeah. leaders are... Uh, John, I just wanted to say that's a brilliant point. I'm sorry, you've got me bouncing in my chair on that. And Kelly, I just <laughs> want to tell you, that when you continue this or wrap it, it's just, this is why we exist. So this is why yes. Bernie 2016 TV yes. exists. I just thank you, John. I just I had to interrupt. That was just beautiful. You're just you're knocking it out of the park, man. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, and but I think what the important thing is here is to recognize that no matter who we 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 elect as president, we the people have to stay in there 
And that didn't happen with Obama. You know, the, the, the election, the, the first election of, of, of Obama was, was, was almost like a, 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 a religious revival. You know, there's music, there's shouting, people are really involved. But once he gets into office, we the people said, okay, we elected him, let him do his work. Meanwhile, he's getting tremendous pressure from everyone. We have no idea of the threats and the carrots and everything else that's held out there. Plus, he's got a, a, a Congress to deal with. He's got over 100,000 lobbyists. Many of them, there's only about 13, less than 13,000 people registered as political lobbyists, but there's a lot more than that who are actually political lobbyists. People like Chris Dodd, who retired from the Senate and became a political advisor. He's not a registered lobbyist, but he is a lobbyist. But our presidents, our leaders have to deal with amazing things. So it's important for us to recognize that we have to do it, and probably through corporations because corporations are calling the shots and yet right. ultimately corporations have to answer to us the consumer ultimately we have to recognize that the marketplace is a democracy if we will only use it as a democracy right and, and I mean to what John was saying and to your point um, the corporations have enormous power and one of the one of the biggest powerhouses as far as, as corporations go is the corporate media um, and you know, how do you feel they have played a role in all of this? Well, it's, yeah. Uh, that, I know this is a huge question, so I'm, I'm prepared to sit back and just <laughs> let you well, have at this one. <laughs> it's a, you know, the, 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 what we call the mainstream media is a farce. You know, at, 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 at best it's irrelevant, and at, in, in general and at worst, it's and I, I just want to say real quick, that's why we're calling it corporate media now, because we are the mainstream media. We are the people. We are their voice. We are the media. So they are the corporate yeah. media. We are the mainstream media. That's, that's a good point. Please that's, continue. I like, <laughs> I like that. And you, the mainstream media, is getting more and more powerful. Uh, you know, this. I, I, I love what you do, Kelly, and, and I'll also have to say, Really and I spent a lot of time in the Middle East and in Europe and in Latin America and all of the United States. And there's so much going on out there. Hold on just one moment, John. We're getting some connection issues. I just want to make sure we have you back all the way before we continue. Say that again. We're, we're having some connectivity issues, I think, so I just want to make sure I have you back all the way before you continue speaking, because there was a little bit of a uh, hiccup there, so I don't think we caught everything that you were saying. All right. Um, Am I on now? Yep, you're on now. You're good. Yeah, I'm, you're freezing on me, too. Well, this is the this is uh, the the lack of a decent uh, internet infrastructure in the United States because we spent all that money on weapons, uh, while other nations are putting in uh, broadband across the country and high speed light uh, you know fiber. Uh, we've got corporations fighting over who gets to put it where. So. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I'm looking at I'm on a a Wi-Fi out in the woods of New Hampshire. That may be, but I, it looks like I've got four bands. So I. Yeah, and this and this just could be satellites too. So uh, we know that Mr. Perkins is in a, a cabin in the woods, uh, pretty far uh, removed, but he's got uh, internet access. And Kelly, just uh, take it as we get John back. John, you may have to cut to audio only if it keeps up. Yeah. I'll help you with that. I, it sounds like his sound is coming back in, but yeah, John, if if you can hear this, um, if you want to just click on the the video at the top of the hangout there, we can just transmit your audio so at least we can get your message out because um, I, I really want to hear your response to the question about the mainstream media. Um, so just continue to try to speak and, and as soon as we can get a, a nice clear stream of you, we'll get you back on the air and I'm sorry everyone and uh, for those of you who are just turning in uh, or just starting to watch, we're interviewing Mr. John Perkins, author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman and Hoodwinked um, and a new book that's coming out as well. Um, I don't know if someone has the name of that one either, but maybe he hasn't said it yet. Do we? Yeah. 
Now, you know, I just put up a card here, Kelly. We need to call him and get him back. Everybody, we're just going to be on hold for one second here. I'm just going to you know, leave this up and turn the audio off, and we're going to take a I, second. Or what do you want to do, Kelly? I was going to say, I've got a video. You know, we've been having some heavy conversations, so we can, like, lighten it up a little bit. Um, this Great. video made me laugh pretty hard. I think it's in our in my rundown for my break. So let's throw that up, and let's, let's take a break until John gets back in here and we get everything going again. All right. Ah. Yep. Yep. Uh, Species Elite. Give me one second. I'll pull that up and we will run it, Kelly. Okay, sounds good. John, we'll come back to you. We're just going to take a quick break and uh, then we'll come back to the interview with John Perkins right after this. Make sure audio is everything. Okay. Hello. Hey John. hey John, how's it going? Are we? And, and here. <laughs> oh, hey <okay>. guys. <laughs> Sorry. We're back. We're not going to take a break. John's here, and I want to talk to him. So John, let's get back to where we were. Um, and uh, so I'd asked you about the the mainstream or the corporate media, um, and what role you feel they play in this, and how you think, well, just basically how you think we can either use them or get rid of them. Yeah, I think I've got to be careful what I say, because I think there's this drone hovering over my house that's shutting me off if I say the wrong thing. So I, I think I need to say, Kelly, that, that I just think, you know, NBC and CBS and ABC are doing a phenomenal job of getting the word out there, and big, I'm obviously kidding. I'm saying that for the drone. <laughs> The corporate media, the corporate media, as I was saying, at, at best is is irrelevant, and at worst and at normal is is uh, just pure propaganda. There's no question about it. Uh, it's owned by the corporatocracy, either outright ownership or through advertising budgets. At the same time, the the the, the good news is that all over the world, there are people like you who we're now calling the mainstream media. Uh, that are doing uh, shows like this. I mean, your show is fantastic, and it's good to know that there are a lot of people that are really getting the real word out there. Uh, you know, and and so so that the, the information is out there, and and you know, we all have these little phones that we carry around with us all the time, and can tune into anything that we we want. I mean, all information is available today. That's just yes. phenomenal. And yeah, I think absolutely. Yeah, there's a and, and you know what I, what I'm really finding is that there's a consciousness revolution. I travel constantly since 2004 when Confessions came out. I've been on a globe trotting, uh, speaking tour, constantly traveling around the world. And you know, everywhere I go, people are waking up. They're understanding that this system, this death economy we have created, is a failure, and we have to change it. And they're now beginning to take action more and more. They've been waking up for some time, and now they're, you know, so the first step is to wake up. Consciousness revolution, perhaps the biggest revolution in history. Uh, once you have that consciousness revolution, you wake up, and then you start to realize you've got to take action. And that's where we're at today, to recognize that we must take action. Absolutely. And I, and I think that that really speaks to a, a lot of the people who watch our channel, because... Um, as you may be aware, Bernie Sanders is running for president, and his his entire platform is centered around us, the people. And on the back of all his shirts, it says, "Join the political revolution today." Um, and that's a huge message. That's something that we've desperately needed to hear. And I think that you're right when you, when you talk about how um, there's a consciousness revolution going. As someone who's been, you know, pretty active on social media and, and kind of you know, talking to people a lot. Uh, I've noticed it too. In, in everyone that I speak with, we've, we've been sick and tired of things. Enough is enough. Um, and so I know that that's one of the things that is, is just kind of sweeping this country. Um, so I got to ask you, from an American perspective, that the mainstream media, or the corporate media, it's going to be hard for me to get used to that. <laughs> um, the corporate media has played a role, obviously, in, in, in the propaganda machine. But are you aware of any other sort of economic hitman style tactics that are taking place in this country that we may not be aware of? Huge. 
absolutely huge. And that's what my new book that comes out in February of 2016 called The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman really addresses how in the last 10 years, 12 years, um, it, you know, you can even start to date it since 9-11 if you wanted to do that. We've seen a monstrous change where the economic hitmen have come home to roost to the United States. Uh, you know, the, the abundance of lobbyists, and that's a form of economic hitmen that, 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 that threaten um, uh, our Congress people, senators and House of Representative people, both on a national and a state level, uh, threaten them and also bribe them in many, many ways. So, you know, uh, we just heard uh, yesterday or day before that the Speaker of the House uh, is, you know, Republican is, is leaving. He's, he's retiring. Well, it's going to be really interesting to see what he does next, isn't it? What do you want to bet right. that he becomes a lobbyist? He may not register as a lobbyist, but he, that he goes to work as a political consultant and he'll have a lot of power. And we've seen that happen with Democrats and Republicans alike. And they put tremendous pressure on people and communities. Uh, I, I'm, I have two homes. Really, I have a, a home which I'm at right now. is a little cabin in the woods of New Hampshire. My grandfather built about 100 years ago. But my, I, my main home is a, another small home uh, on an island off the coast of Seattle. And that state, Washington, just uh, succumbed a few years ago to a huge campaign by Boeing uh, to get amazing tax breaks. Uh, almost 300 corporations, the largest, most profitable corporations in the United States don't pay taxes. In fact, they get grants and subsidies because of their economic hitmen that go into communities or states like Washington and say, hey, we're going to move our facilities, we're going to build our next huge plant in Texas or someplace else unless you give us a huge tax break. These are corporations that don't need tax breaks. These are corporations that should be paying huge amounts of taxes. They use our, they use fire, fire, and they, they, you know, they use our airports, our roads, our highways, our schools, our fire services, our police services, all these things that, that you and I pay for out of our tax money, and they don't pay any taxes, and yet they use them, and their employees use them big time. So, with the corporations, you know, playing such a major role, we talk about a political revolution. Is there another way to approach this problem? Because there's a lot of people that are very anti-big government. They don't want to see, you know, big brother. They, they envision government as big brother. Um, so I guess it's a two-part question. You know, number one, do you think it's possible for us to, instead of using government to handle this, um, directly attack, or not attack, but try to work with and change corporations? Or do you think that the other way is more effective? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I think we have to do it through the corporations because they control the government. Um, you know, as I said earlier, most of the people who are currently in government are going to be looking for jobs in corporations or as consultants to corporations when they leave government. They probably came from corporations. This is revolving door, which is huge and very powerful. The corporations pay for most uh, political campaigns. Everybody knows that. Um, they are calling the shots around the world. It's not just in the United States. They call the shots in Russia and China, too, to perhaps to a lesser degree, but those economies would not function without these huge global corporations. We need to understand that, and we need to understand that we, the people, have a lot of power over these corporations. Back when I was in college, there was apartheid in South Africa. We boycotted corporations that supported it, and it pretty much ended it. Rivers in the United States were terribly polluted. Some were on fire with pollution in, in Ohio. We, you know, we forced corporations to clean them up. We forced corporations to open their doors much wider to women and minorities uh, and many, many other things. We've had tremendous success at changing corporations on specific issues. Now we need to go up to the corporate world and say, hey, we're not buying from any corporation that isn't committed to serving a public interest. Forget about this maximizing profit thing. You know, yeah, make a decent rate of return for investors, but we, you've got to move into a new field. We've got to create, Kelly, a life economy. And I can talk about that more if you want to get into that, but we have this death economy based on militarism and ravaging the earth, destroying the resources upon which the earth depends, and we need to move into a whole new type of economy and the corporations can make that happen. In fact, they'll be the most efficient ones to do it. There's a lot of other people who need to be involved, but, but, but it's, it's, it's going to be a corporate move, and I think it's happening. I see it happening with some corporations and in business schools. 
Well, I, I'd love to hear more about the life economy because that to me is, is a, our kind of pathway or a pathway that a one pathway that you see um, through your experience. So yeah, definitely, please, please, please share. Well, if you look around, the, the world is terribly polluted. The oceans are polluted, the lakes, the, the, the rivers. The soil is polluted, terribly polluted. You know, these big agricultural corp, uh, industries have just destroyed much of the earth. The air is polluted. There's a huge economy waiting out there to clean that up. I mean, we can employ a lot of people cleaning up pollution. Uh, what if, you know, our tax, over 50 cents of every, of your, every penny, every, every, over 50 cents of your tax dollar uh, goes to supporting war in one way or another for the military industrial complex. What if instead that money hired the same companies? Raytheon, General Dynamics, to instead of making missiles, uh, to make things that would clean up pollution. And also, let's that money go to entrepreneurs who really can be a driving force behind that. And also, uh, let's, let's invest in new technologies uh, for transportation, communication, energy, that no longer tear up the earth, that recognize that we don't need to dig up any more resources. We've got all the resources we need. All we've got to do is recycle them, reuse them, use the sun more efficiently. There's a huge economy out here waiting that needs to change the banking system, uh, the way that we do marketing, everything. As part of our economy, we have a failed global economy, and we need to change it. And that's going to take a lot of creativity, and it can create a lot of jobs for millions, billions of people what I call a life economy, an economy that is about supporting life rather than destroying it. That's a, a beautiful statement and I, it makes me think about that, that dirty S word, socialism, and the fact that we continuously associate that with a governmental structure. And I think that what we might be better off thinking of it as is a way of thinking, a socialist way of thinking, a, a sort of uh, way to change our culture, not necessarily our government, in that our priorities need to shift towards something that, towards this life economy, towards creating a, a place where people can um, focus on the things that truly are important and, and get this, this focus of money, this golden idol um, that the Pope talked about in his speech in Congress, uh, out of the way. And I think that that's probably going to be one of the only, the only way we can truly change is by at having that global consciousness awakening that, that you were talking about. Um, and, and that kind of brings to mind to me one of the biggest crises that are going on, that is going on right now in the world, the Syrian refugee crisis. You know, over 12 million people have been displaced from their homes. Um, and I mean, I personally feel it's, it's one of the great humanitarian crises of our time. Um, and a lot of people point to the U.S. as being partially responsible. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, or ha have you any experience about the, the train that led us to where we are today with Syria? Well, yes, partially is, uh, <laughs> is selling it short. The U.S. is very responsible for these uh, refugee problems in the Middle East and in Central America. Um, you know, I, and, and I just came from, from Latin America. Uh, I, I flew from the jungles of the Amazon to the forests of New Hampshire a few weeks ago. I spent a lot of time in Latin America. I speak Spanish. And so I would comment on that, that, you know, we talk about the immigration problem. That's caused by our so-called free trade agreements, where the U.S. just exploits the economies of countries like Mexico and Honduras and El Salvador and Nicaragua, Central America especially, and also South America. Uh, through these, through NAFTA, CAFTA, all, all these free, free trade agreements. It, that's what drives people to come to the United States because they can't feed their families anymore by staying in countries that basically our corporations have ravaged their economies. We overthrew the president of Honduras, the CIA did in, in 2009, President Zelaya, because he stood up to Dole and Chiquita and other big U.S. based global corporations. Uh, in the mid and so the immigration problem from Central America is a problem that the United States has created. There's no question about it. If we want to solve that problem, what we need to do is help the, the people of those countries, the, the people, uh, not the political leaders, not the few very wealthy families, but the majority of the people to make a decent living. That's what we need to do. Likewise in the Middle East. This, these wars that we've created there and, and in the process have also essentially created 
uh, or strengthened uh, Islamic extremism. There's no question. I mean, as far as we know, ISIS didn't even exist until we went, went into that part of the world. Um, and destroying the economies of these countries uh, has forced people to leave. The violence, the destruction, that's why people are swarming to Europe to a large degree. And some people speculate that it may have something to do with climate change too, and that's very likely. But let's face it, we also have to take a lot of responsibility for climate change. So I think it's, it's incredibly important for people in the United States to recognize the huge impact that we, our economy, and our military have on the world. Interestingly, people in most of the rest of the world do understand the impact the United States has. I can talk to illiterate peasants in the streets of La Paz, Bolivia, in Spanish, and they can read a newspaper, but they know a lot more about what's going on in the world than a lot of people with PhDs in economics in the United States. It's, it's a sad state of affairs, but it's true. Right. And that gets, back right. and to, that gets back to that corporate media that you were talking about, too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it goes back to Eisenhower's speech about um, the informed electorate and about people being invested in, and this machine that's taught us to care about the biggest car, to watch uh, all of these shows on TV, reality TV shows that we're, that are kind of just brainwashing us into what is important. I mean, it's, it's all connected. Um, and so for me, when I was living through this and kind of before my eyes were open, so to speak, it created a sort of hopelessness, a sort of feeling like I can't do anything. There's no way I could possibly do anything. So are there any, are there any small steps that you think that people can take to kind of get over that initial feeling of hopelessness? Um, I think that to begin with is to recognize that none of our steps when we move in that direction are small, that we all have a lot of power. Every one of us is a very powerful individual. I mean, if you, anybody out there can think of who's your hero? You know, I don't know, Mother Teresa, uh, Gandhi, uh, wh whoever it is. Uh, they're, they're just a person. You know, they started, they didn't have any idea what they were doing when they got started. They didn't know they were going to be successful. Uh, I, I often think of, of uh, Rosa Parks, you know. What did Rosa Parks do? She walked to the front of a bus. <laughs> it's not a, it didn't seem like a big move, but it changed the world. Rachel Carson, who wrote the book Silent Spring, basically started an environmental movement, sat down at a desk one day with a pencil and a piece of paper in a little house in Pennsylvania and started writing. She had no idea her book would ever be published, much less that it would start a, an environmental movement globally. We, we all have tremendous power. And we need to each of us follow our deepest passions and, and channel our power in that direction. But if we recognize that we have this power and, 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 and move in that direction, in fact, the new book I have that's coming out has a whole, has a bunch of lists of things different people can do, students, retired people, corporate executives, what we all can do. But we all can take different paths. So your path is this program. My path is writing books. But a carpenter can take a path of building houses with great consciousness about the environment. A dentist can constantly talk to her clients while she's got her hands in her client's mouth about the importance. <laughs> about the holding importance. them hostage. <laughs> right, about the, exactly. Every one of us. But if we, so we can all take different paths, but let's aim for the same destination, which is creating an environmentally sustainable, socially just, emotionally, spiritually, whatever you want to say, fulfilling world for, for, for all people and in fact for all species because uh, we need them all. Uh, if we all head to that same destination, we'll get there. And But to be more specific, one thing everybody can constantly do is pick a cause, pick a corporation, pick Nike, pick Monsanto, pick Exxon, pick whatever you want to pick and, and start a campaign because consumer campaigns are very, very powerful. Let me give you one example. So, okay, so Nike. So get all your friends, everybody you've got on Facebook and Twitter and, and everywhere else, and once a week, ask, tell, ask them all to send out a letter to, to Nike saying, hey, I love your products, but I'm not going to buy anymore until you pay those slaves working in your sweatshops a decent wage and, and turn them from slaves into good employees who benefit from working for you, who can afford to buy your product. And, you know, ask, send them to everybody on your list. And, and ask everybody on that list to send them to everybody on their list. And there's a tremendous power in doing that. 
uh, CEOs get matrices every month of what their customers are saying on email. They don't, the CEO doesn't read all the emails, but somebody's making a, a list of these things. It's powerful. And to recognize that corporations have a great deal of power, and most of the people working for corporations ultimately want to be forced to do the right thing. At least that's my experience. Uh, that's a beautiful message, and I, I can't think of anything else that I could even ask you after, after you saying that. Um, so I want to give you a chance to just talk about your new book and, and maybe any upcoming events or anything else that you want to speak about. Um, and we'll give a chance for some of the, the users to ask questions if they have anything they, they want to ask. Sure. Uh, well, this book comes out in, in February. It's, it's an amazing book. <laughs> I put a lot into it. It's, and it's really come out of what's happened in the last 10, 12 years since I wrote Concessions of an Economic Hitman, how much worse it's gotten on one level and how much better it's gotten on another level. And the better is that there's an awakening around the, the planet. And so this book is, amongst other things, it, 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 it exposes things that I did as an economic hitman that I didn't dare write about in the first book, but I do now. And then it goes on to really talk about what we all can do to to create a, 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 a life economy, to create a world that our grandchildren will be proud to inherit from us and our great-grandchildren. Um, and I won't go into a lot more detail there, but I would suggest that people go to my website, johnperkins.org. There's a little box where you've got to fill in your name, your, 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 your email address, and get my newsletters once a month. Uh, that will keep you updated on these things. And I'm on Facebook and Twitter, so I really look forward to it. Uh, to well, talking to your audience more, and and I do and I do have a lot of public appearances in different places, but those are all on my website too. So it's all right there. Go to the website johnperkins.org. Okay. Thanks. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. You know, we did get one question that I actually find really interesting. So if you don't mind, just one more question before we get out of here today. Um, sure. Let's see here. Um, do other countries have economic hitman? Have they tried to hit the U.S.? Is that even possible? Well, yeah, other countries certainly have economic hitman, and now I think it's important to recognize that every major corporation has economic hitman. In my day, it was it was countries, primarily the United States, but today Monsanto has economic hitman, and Shell Oil Company has economic hitman, and Kmart and Walmart and all major corporations have economic hitmen that are just pushing for the benefits of that particular company, trying to get the best deals it possibly can everywhere in the world, the lowest w wages, the least environmental restrictions, things that really hurt the planet and hurt all of us ultimately. And to recognize that and that we have to balance that out by letting these companies know that we're just not going to buy from them. The companies that do that, we're not going to buy from. Um, so yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of other countries with economic hitmen. And perhaps this is a good time to address the China issue, uh, which is big right now. You know, China, the United States had an opportunity when the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, 1991 basically, uh, the United States and its corporations had an opportunity to set an amazing example for the world, to do really good things, to promote democracy, equality, fairness, and so on. We, in, but the United States and its corporations, in essence, did the opposite. Went out and exploited the world, built military bases in over 130 countries, has a military presence in, in all the rest of them also, basically. Uh, exploited resources, made a lot of enemies, basically, people that resent us. Today, you can go to Latin America, as I do, and talk to presidents there or cabinet ministers, and they'll tell you that they would much rather borrow money from China than from the United States. And they'll say things like, well, China's never assassinated any one of our leaders. The United States has admitted to assassinating Allende in Chile. We saw the film earlier, Arbenz of Guatemala, and many others. Uh, China's never had a military presence on our soil. The United States has. We have military bases here, and so on and so forth. And I'll say to them, well, don't you think China's going to take the same route? And they'll say, well, possibly, but we don't know that. What we do know is that the U.S. and its corporations will do that. They've done it. They've proven that they do that. I think that's a shame, Kelly. I think it's really sad that, 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 we, that, that our corporations have created that impression, and, and, and it's more than an impression. They, they've taken those actions. We, the people of the United States um, and the rest of the world, 
uh, need to let these corporations know that we're no longer going to put up with that and let our government know also we're just not going to accept that and there's a better world out here to happen there's a, there's a life economy and we're going to make it happen the programs like yours getting out there and, and speaking and encouraging people to take action is so incredibly important and I thank you for what you're doing well I thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming on the show and sharing this with us um, and for all that you do for speaking out um, you are an inspiration to me the courage that it took to stand up and, and tell your story when there was no one ready to listen to you um, so thank you and I hope that you'll come back and talk about your new book with us when it comes out um, and with our viewers I'd love to you know how to get in touch with me so yeah yes come I do. February, <laughs> let's do it again <laughs> keep up your great. good work in the meantime thank you so much thank you so nice. thank you everyone for joining us uh, to speak with John and thank you for all your great questions and I just want to say that you know it isn't just it isn't just our lack of interest that's a problem and our lack of voter turnout it, it's the fact that our society is almost ignoring all of these critical battles uh, in in our country to to speak out to have a voice um, we've, we're letting this rhetoric of government is evil or uh, all these wedge issues to to break us apart and to make us think that we can't make a difference to make us feel hopeless um, and so to what John said use your voice uh, stand up don't be afraid um, don't let him control you the corporations the the evil in this world don't let it make you feel hopeless um, and so I'd like to uh, share this last song this last video uh, from Colin Martin he stood up and did something um, and this song moves me and I hope it moves you into action um, Aimful 63 I'm standing up educate yourself vote and do something thank you so much everyone have a great rest of your day. Give it to me, John. <laughs>
for truth Your vote is worth all our freedom bells And burn away the ignorance that compromises governments For the people sovereign, a ring goes freedom bells Feel the burn, feel the burn, do something Feel the burn, feel the burn, do something Feel the burn, feel the burn, do something Feel the burn, feel the burn now we've got an opportunity to be an example the world needs to see. What if our political parties sought to invest in harmony? Well, we've got a dream that all beings know peace, cause we all deserve it. Leadership, community, shared responsibility. This way the world is turning and someone is singing prayers in the heart of Washington. We've getting up out of our chairs to do something. Oh, someone is singing a prayer in the heart of Washington. And we're getting up out of our chairs to do something. Do something. Feel the burn, feel the burn. Feel the burn, feel the burn. Do something. Feel the burn, feel the burn. 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 Ring those freedom, ring those freedom, ring those freedom bells. We do this for a high purpose. I want to make sure that the world that we leave them is a beautiful world where people can live full and dignified lives. I don't want to see a world where people are struggling and stepping all over each other. Huge.